This is the American Dream Mall. The dream was turned into reality by the same developers that brought us the iconic Mall of America in Minnesota. But this one is located in New Jersey, and it took 16 years and $5 billion to build. The structure is 3 million square feet, or 279,000 square meters in area. To put that into perspective, here's the same area mapped onto Chicago. That's 25 square blocks, from Michigan Avenue to LaSalle, and Jackson up to Randolph. Inside these spaces are stores, of course, 500 of them, as well as Nickelodeon-themed amusement parks, and water parks, an indoor ice rink, and an indoor ski resort. It's called Big Snow, and it's the first indoor ski park in North America. A two-hour ticket costs 50 bucks, but you can watch a live feed of the excitement on BigSnowAmericanDream.com. The 160-foot vertical slope, or 16-story tall structure, pops up precariously from the surrounding concrete parking garages that set atop its slender steel stilts. You can ski its four acres of runs on real snow year-round. In total, that's 5,500 tons of snow packed two feet thick. They used 12,000-pound snowcat to groom the slopes. It had to be delivered by crane and hoisted into place. The machine roams the slopes running on clean diesel, which is supposedly efficient enough to operate inside without creating too much of a health hazard. Everything in here is engineered to look and act as authentically as possible to give visitors a replica experience of skiing on a natural mountain. The space is climate controlled to a consistent 28 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 2 degrees Celsius using heavy duty chillers. The building draws so much energy that the local infrastructure had to be upgraded to be able to accommodate it. The American Dream Mall opened in 2019 directly into the pandemic. Its financial struggles are the stuff of legend and serve as a cautionary tale within the larger narrative that's around the decline of shopping malls and maybe even the decline of suburbs in general. As a Hail Mary last ditch effort, the design pulls out all the stops to create a successful mall going experience. It represents the last gasp along a journey called Disneyfication, the commercial transformation of things, i.e. entertainment, or environments into something simplified, controlled, and safe, reminiscent of the Walt Disney brand. Also in this case, it includes heightening the spectacle of the mall going experience by importing theme park like attractions. When malls were first conceived, shopping was enough to draw people together within a miniature city inside of a building. The mall was a place where people could have authentic seeming public interactions in a suburban environment that's not so conducive to meeting in public otherwise. I don't want to go into the entire history of malls here, there are plenty of good videos on the subject, I'll just link to one above. Rather, what I find fascinating are how malls developed expert levels of control and heightened levels of artificiality masquerading as nature as a means of increasing sales. Big Snow is an obviously exaggerated version of this, a fang mountain inside of a building, but the mall is actually saturated with all sorts of fake natures there to enhance the experience. Some of these are so good that you never even noticed that they were there. This all might seem obvious, like of course there's a certain level of artificiality inside of any indoor environment. But as malls are dying, they're getting ever more savvy in order to survive. And they're looking to increasingly sophisticated methods for creating artificial environments that operate on us unsuspecting shoppers. And the targeted attention paid to nature isn't innocent. Being at Old Orchard Mall kind of reminded me of being home in Africa. By the watering hole. In the movie Mean Girls, Katie had spent the last 12 years living in Africa, which means she's experiencing teenage life in the northern suburbs of Chicago with a heightened level of observational skills. By the way, they claim to be at the Old Orchard Mall in Skokie, Illinois, but this is the real version, which isn't quite so photogenic. But the fountain as a Saharan watering hole isn't too distant a metaphor. Fountains have all sorts of documented climactic and psychological effects on those that encounter them. For more about fountains, check out this video on their history in the urban environment of Chicago. In one study, cancer patients were shown a video of waterfalls, creeks, and ocean waves. These patients who were in chronic pain experienced 20 to 30% reduction in the stress hormones cortisol and epinephrine. Exposure to nature kicks off all sorts of physiological reactions into gear, most of which we're not in full control of. The American Dream Mall's architect, the firm Gensler, also did a study of malls and noted that biophilic design principles are trending up in shopping mall design. Integrated green spaces encourage better mental health and well-being by promoting more human reconnection with nature. The result is a design that is better received by the public and the natural environment. While this shows up in obvious ways, it also comes out in some pretty curious practices as well. For instance, we left off the conversation about Big Snow talking about the control of its air. 
Of course, all malls are air conditioned, meaning they are temperature and humidity controlled. But did you know that the scent of shopping mall air is also designed and controlled? Obviously, it smells delicious walking next to a Cinnabon or a popcorn store. And I do know they use fans to artificially spread these smells. But that's not what I'm really talking about. Companies like Scent Air are dedicated to producing scents to heighten the retail experience. They have dozens of scents to choose from, including natural sources like Pinewood Forest and Island Breeze. But they've also worked with food brands like Cold Stone Creamery to generate artificial scents that will make your space smell like ice cream, such as apple pie a la Cold Stone. They claim that the use of their scents inside of a store can actually improve customer satisfaction by up to 20%, earn up to 9% more in sales revenue, and increase store linger time up to 18%. The chemical concoctions are typically deployed within diffusers, which can either be standalone units or attached to the general HVA system of a space. The scent air stream diffuser, for instance, works for spaces that are larger than 3,000 square feet. You know who else is in the retail scent game? A company called Mood Media. They have over 1,600 scents to choose from for pumping into retail spaces. But Mood Media does more than just manufacture scents for the air you breathe. They provide resources for all sorts of atmospheric manipulations. You may have heard of a company that they acquired a few years ago called Muzak. They supply an endless stream and variety of sounds for retail spaces to tickle your ears while you shop. These sounds are meant to be heard unconsciously, draw enough attention to hook you with their effects, but not enough though that you notice. Professor Gary Gumpert said about Muzak, it's a kind of amniotic fluid that surrounds us. It never startles us, it is never too loud, it is never too silent, it is always there. The concept of background music owes much of its development to French composer Eric Satie. His piece Furniture Music was meant to be played as if it did not exist, to be construed as a facet of the environment and no more. By the 1940s, buffeted by research indicating that music had a physiological influence upon behavior, Muzak introduced the stimulus progression, 15-minute stretches of background instrumentals that are meant to give the listeners a boost of productivity over the course of an hour. Muzak's engineers restyled themselves as audio architects, crafting sonic atmospherics for retail environments that were intended to dramatically offset the store from the surrounding area, inducting the customer into a way of life for the duration of their stay in the store. In, say, Mall of America, every single space is hardwired for sound, and there are three main speaker systems. These don't all just play music, either. The hallway speakers do, like Muzak, but the ones beneath the tree foliage play sounds of nature, like cricket singing. Muzak built on this concept and found a niche delivering recorded music through hidden speakers in retail environments. Muzak were so often hidden among large potted plants that people called it potted palm music. Speaking of trees, those are usually fake in a mall, too. A company called Nature Maker makes products called Steel Art Trees. They claim that each handmade tree is a bold synthesis of art, masterful engineering, and original arboreal sculpture. Life-size and true to scale, each tree perfectly captures the nuances of silhouette, trunk, branch, bark, and limb structure. Certified welders create the underlying structure of the approved design, and Nature Maker's proprietary arboreal texture and foliage is applied and hand-painted by artisans. Each tree is then disassembled, shipped, and reassembled on site. The fakeness continues on the floors of epoxy made to look like stone, or even extend to the ceiling with LED lighting fixtures that mimic daylight to make you feel outdoors, like in the painted ceiling of the Villaggio Mall in Cotter. But all of this artificially composed and constructed nature goes to operating on our human nature. Of course, malls serve our desires to accumulate material objects and increasingly to provide meaningful experiences, but this too is highly constructed. Practices like geofencing track the movement of people through the mall to study their locations and to serve them targeted ads and notifications on their phones. This data is then used to understand behavior and leads to more refined practices for keeping customers engaged. The architect Rem Kolhas and a team of students studied shopping closely and compiled their findings in a book that was called The Harvard Guide for Shopping. In it, they called the mall an ecology and in fact found that concepts and mechanisms of ecology provide very accurate models for understanding the shopping mall. It's like the survival of the fittest. The behavior of forms and malls is similar to laws of ecology. Patches of soft cores and tentacles. Part of the theory is that both zones in malls and things like living cells or ecosystems are driven by having perimeters that are receptive to interaction. Kulhas believes this explains the crazy shapes that we find in malls better than any other architectural or urban design theories. 
Interestingly, the mall's origin is traced to the architect and developer Victor Gruen that wanted to import the positive aspects of public life of an urban plaza into the suburbs, to bring a piece of the city into sprawling and manicured nature-soaked suburbs. For him, the courtyard, covered by a skylight, was actually modeled after European arcades that had flourished in Vienna and other cities in the early 19th century. Gruen called this the Garden Court of Perpetual Spring. People could break from the shopping to enjoy sculptures, carnivals, cafes, nature, etc. in any season of the year. This became a hallmark of shopping mall architecture, that you could have trees inside, or a goldfish pond, or an aviary, or a garden cafe. All this was meant to be in service of providing public urban life to suburbanites. It's interesting to me that the place that already has an abundance of artificial nature, composed of mowed lawns and trimmed hedges, needed even more in order to provide the kinds of spaces that cities have naturally. But we all know that the mall didn't end up providing the kind of public space that Gruen was seeking. Instead, the mall as a building type is dying, and Disneyfication is trying to keep the last few alive, complete with ever more extremes of artificial natures. Even Victor Gruen disavowed his invention later in life. Two years before his passing, he declared, I would like to take this opportunity to disclaim paternity once and for all. I refuse to pay alimony to those bastard developments. They destroyed our cities. And so today we get malls like the American Dream Mall or Villaggio Mall in Cotter, which is famous for its 150 meter indoor canal based on an Italian hill town and complete with gondolas. They have the power to take us anywhere from anywhere like a virtual transporter. The artificial natures of malls with fake plants and trees may look nice, but they don't offer any of the ecological benefits of real plants. They don't provide oxygen, they don't support biodiversity, and they don't help improve the air quality. In fact, some fake plants and trees are even made from materials that can be harmful to the environment. So next time you're at the mall, take a moment to appreciate the fake nature around you, but also consider the overall impact that it might be having on the actual environment outside. When you give to charity, how much of an impact will your donation actually have? This question can be hard to answer, if not impossible. Most charities can't tell you how your money will be used or how much good it will accomplish. You may know it could theoretically help a cause, but how? Or more importantly, how much? If you want to help people living in poverty with evidence-backed, high-impact charities, I recommend that you check out GiveWell. GiveWell spends over 40,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only directs funds to a few of the highest impact, evidence-backed opportunities that they've found. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve lives of millions more. And using GiveWell's research is free. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. They publish all of their research and recommendations on their site for free and no signups required. They allocate your tax-deductible donations to the charity or fund that you choose without taking any cut. I give to bed nets because their $5 nets help prevent malaria infections around the globe by protecting children while they sleep. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommendation charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of this year, or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to givewell.org and pick YouTube and enter Stuart Hicks at checkout. Make sure that they know that you heard GiveWell from Stuart Hicks to get your donation matched. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. You'll be rewarded with bi-weekly videos on the built environment just like this one. While you're waiting for the next video to drop, check out some of these others. See you over there.